Hi, and welcome back to Hacker 101. In this session, we're going to be talking about hacking modern multiplayer games. These are some of the most complex pieces of software imaginable, and that complexity often introduces bugs. Personally, this is a subject that's near and dear to my heart. Game hacking is what got me into reverse engineering and security in the first place. First, a word of warning. This is an area that requires quite strong native hacking and reverse engineering skills. If you haven't already watched our native code crash course video, pause this and go check that out now. Before we dive deep, we're going to talk about some basics of networking as it pertains to multiplayer games. To make sure that we're all on the same page, let's lay out some terminology. First, we have packets. These are discrete pieces of data that are sent over the network. These could be a few bytes long, or as much as 64k of data. Next, let's define game client. In reality, this is two separate things. The actual game binary that's running on a user's machine, and the machine itself. For our purposes, we're going to be using these interchangeably. The same thing applies to servers. It may apply to the code running on a machine, or the machine itself. With that out of the way, let's talk about what the network topology, the conceptual layout of a network, might look like for a couple of game types. First up, we have matchmaking style games. Think first person shooters, MOBAs, and a couple other games where players are in discrete matches and game lobbies. Here we have a number of game clients connected to a set of matchmaking servers waiting for a game. On the other side, we can see that each dedicated game server is connected to the matchmaking server, so it can know what's available, how many players are connected, what style of gameplay is available, etc. One thing to note is that these dedicated servers may be run by the game studio or by groups of players themselves. This comes into play later. When a game starts or a server is chosen for a given player, they will maintain a connection to the matchmaking server, so your friends can see what game you're in and it can keep track of active games, but a connection is made from the game client directly to the dedicated server. This connection is where the actual game traffic will take place, movements, actions, chat messages, etc. If you think about the multiplayer games you've played, you'll probably see that this topology covers most of them. Next, let's look at the topology of an MMO, a massively multiplayer online game, like World of Warcraft or EverQuest. In this case, this diagram is almost a complete representation of the EverQuest server setup from the perspective of the client, but this will map to practically every MMO. When the client starts, it first connects to the login server and the player is authenticated there. The client then receives a list of worlds to which they can connect. Each of these world servers connects to the login server to let it know how many players are active, whether player versus player combat is allowed, etc. Once a player chooses a world, the login server tells the world to expect a connection from the client, and the client disconnects from the login server. In place of the login server, it connects to the world server and any additional servers. Typically, the world server will act as a facilitator, telling the client what servers it needs to connect to. This is particularly important for handling handoffs as players move from one zone, an area of the world, to another. As you can see, there's a lot of complexity here. Each and every point along this is a potential vulnerability. One key thing to note regarding games is how data is actually sent to and from the servers. In most scenarios on the web, we want traffic to be received in the order it's sent, we want the server to retry if something fails to send, and we want data to appear as a stream rather than discrete chunks. These things are typically handled by TCP, the Transmission Control Protocol, which underlies everything from HTTP and HTTPS to most other connections made by your device. All of those assumptions are great if you're browsing the web, but each one of them carries overhead that might get you killed in Quake if your connection drops a couple packets. In fact, you probably don't even want to know the movements that they made a couple seconds ago. You only care where they are now. Clearly, TCP isn't the best transport for most real-time games. Thankfully, we have UDP. UDP, or User Datagram Protocol, is a protocol that doesn't ensure any of those things that TCP does. There technically aren't even any connections. You simply tell the operating system where to send a packet, and it sends it. It may never be received, or it may come after packets that were sent much later. 
Since we do want some degree of reliability, games using UDP will typically build their own transport protocol on top of it. These protocols allow the games to detect if critical information was missed and resend that data, prioritize the important things if packets are being lost, batch small packets together to increase efficiency, and more. They do all this without adding the same overhead and always reliable nature of TCP. Finally, let's talk protocol encryption. The vast majority of games include some kind of encryption for the packets they send, so that they can't be tampered with, either by a malicious attacker or a cheater. Since we care greatly about overhead and stability of the game, this is intentionally kept very simple. It won't hold up to a motivated attacker, but it will keep out the low effort hacks and make your life more difficult as a hacker. We won't go into too much detail on this since the encryption varies greatly from game to game, but let's talk about one potential route a game might take. First, the client connects to the login server over a secure protocol like HTTPS and authenticates as usual. The game client will have an embedded copy of the server's public key to ensure it's connecting to a valid server. Next, the login server sends an encryption key to both the client and the actual game server. Lastly, the client connects to the game server. Each packet gets encrypted using that shared key that was pre-established by the login server. This key never goes over an insecure channel, so it's invulnerable to sniffing by either a passive attacker or an attacker attempting to man in the middle of the login connection. Now that we've got the networking basics out of the way, let's talk reverse engineering. Most games that you'll be interested in hacking on aren't open source, so knowing how to reverse engineer the different pieces of the game is critical. We're going to talk about a few different angles here. Not all of them will be viable for every game. The most obvious way is to start by disassembling and analyzing the game client binary. If you take this route, the key things you'll want to do are find the encryption routines, find and dissect the code handling the game protocol, reverse engineer any code for loading assets, and find and defeat anti-debugging mechanisms. This is by no means a complete list, but those are the things I personally look at when I take this route. Anything that can come from a server in a way you can control is something you need to look at. Each of those is a potential bug. A word of warning though, looking at the game binary isn't going to get you banned, but attaching a debugger or making any patches to the game very likely will. These activities look just like what cheaters do, and it's likely that you'll end up setting off alarm bells pretty much immediately. As we talked about earlier, sometimes it's possible to run your own server for games. When this is an option, it's a really great one. The steps are basically the same as reversing the client, but there are a number of huge advantages. There's usually no anti-debugger protection, there's a whole lot less code to dig through, and there are generally way more inputs to the server than to the client. When it's available, the dedicated server is always where I look first. Another great approach, albeit one that takes a lot of time and work up front, is to build proxies for the game traffic. If you have the game connecting to your custom proxy and then to the server from there, you get complete control over the traffic. This can make it really easy to test specific areas for vulnerabilities on both the client and server side, and generally lead to amazing bugs. The big downside to this approach is really just the time required but the level of understanding that you get from this approach is phenomenal. Lastly, let's talk about some real potential target areas and some real bugs people have found. In matchmaking scenarios like we talked about before, specifically when you can run your own server, you get to provide a server name, IP and port, and other info. Typically this gets forwarded right to the client. In a scenario just like this, Vinny Van and OXACB found a buffer overflow in the way Steam handled this data, leading to remote code execution and an $18,000 bounty. You can check out this report in the description for the video, or look up the report ID on HackerOne. We mentioned chat a bit earlier, but it bears mentioning as a target in itself. There are usually a lot of different inputs to in-game chat, which means a lot of different possibilities for attack. 
This can be anything from a buffer overflow in the length of a message itself, which is unlikely but possible, to things like crashing the client via an improperly formed message color code. This can be a surprisingly rich area for exploitation. One of the most complex parts of a game is actually loading assets, whether that's map files, textures, fonts, or otherwise. Because of the complexity and the performance needs, this code is often written with the assumption that the studio will always have complete control over the data, and thus it doesn't need to be hardened against attacks. While that's generally true, there are big exceptions, most notably in first-person shooters. With these games, it's generally possible for a server to send down new map files and character models. If you can manipulate those assets remotely, that poses a huge security risk, since this loading code is almost never well tested. The hacker Chippy found such a bug in Half-Life, which had existed in the public for 20 years. This report is also linked in the video description if you'd like to read the details. The moral here is, even older games can and do contain nasty bugs and asset loading code. It's a huge attack surface. Many games developed in the last decade or so contain some form of embedded browser. This is often done for the purposes of showing documentation, account settings, support, and other functionality along those lines. Conveniently for us hackers, the pages in these browsers can be vulnerable to most of the same web bugs that you're familiar with. Additionally, these browsers are often supplied with bindings to various internal APIs, allowing everything from asset loading to manipulating the game UI or performing character actions. Once you get control over the browser, via XSS for instance, you can use a snippet like we have here to enumerate those APIs. This will log everything in the global scope, which will typically point you to where you need to look. Since these APIs won't generally be documented, it's typically a lot of exploring JavaScript objects and then trial and error to figure out how to exploit them. Congratulations on making it this far and taking your first steps to becoming a game hacker. If you enjoyed this, consider liking the video and subscribing to our channel. As always, thanks for watching and happy breaking.